the four applications of mindfulness. Contemplation of the body as impure. Everyone sees his body as extremely precious. Because you think it is real, you are selfish and profit-seeking. Without a body, there would be no selfishness. We think our bodies are real and actual. Being selfish, we create offenses and commit evil deeds. We cannot let go of the offense of the world and calculate on behalf of our bodies all day long, looking for good food, beautiful clothes, and a nice place to live, a little happiness for the body. On the day we die, we are still unclear. My body is dying, we mourn. How can he do this to me? At that time, we know that our bodies are unreal, but it's too late, too late for our regress. Ultimately, is the body real? Stupid people think so, but wise people see it merely as a combination of the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. It is not ultimate. Then you ask, what is ultimate? Our own self-nature is bright and all-illumining. Our own self-nature is perfect and unimpeded. It is nowhere and nowhere is it not. To the end of empty space, it exhausts the drama realm. Our bodies are temporary dwellings where our self-nature comes to live it for a time. But the person dwelling in the hotel is not the hotel and in the same way his body is not him. The traveler who thinks that he is the hotel is mistaken. If you know that the body is just like a hotel, you should seek that which dwells within it, for once you have found it, you will recognize your true self. From the time of birth, the body is impure, and a combination of its father's semen and its mother's blood. The child grows up with greed, hatred, stupidity, pride, and doubt. He commits offenses, creating the karma of killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and taking intoxicants and drugs. Offense karma is created because of the body, but is the body such a precious thing after all? No. A precious jewel is pure and undefined, without stain or the slightest trace of filth. Our bodies, on the other hand, have nine apertures, which constantly secrete impure substance. Tears from the eyes, wax from the ears, mucus from the nose. There are religions whose members eat mucus. They say that they are smelting the cinnabar. They also eat tears and earwax, thinking that these filthy substances are precious jewels. Isn't that pitiful? Two ears, two eyes, and two nostrils make six holes. The mouth is full of phlegm and saliva. That's seven holes. At the anus and urinary tract and you have nine. Would you call this pure? Everyone knows that excrement and urine are unclean and if you don't believe it, just try seasoning some fine food with a tiny pinch of excrement. No one will eat it. People will want to vomit instead because it is unclean. Would you call this body the rippling filth from night holes a jewel? If it's a jewel, why do such vile things flow from it? If you don't bath for a week, you itch and squirm, and a thick crust forms on your body. Where did it come from? Soon you stink with an odor, even the dog finds it repulsive. What is the advantage of having a body? Contemplate the body as impure. If you see how filthy it is, do you still love it? Are you still attached? What's the use of loving such a dirty thing? Then, can I stop myself? Can I kill myself? You ask. 
No, that's not necessary. You must borrow this false body and use it to cultivate the truth. The self nature dwells within the body. To enter the body of five skandhas and the yin and yang must, in a combination of purity and filth, which is your body. If you cultivate, you can go up and attain purity. If you do not cultivate, you will go down. Create offense, karma, unite with the field and turn into a ghost. Go up, become a Buddha. Whether or not you cultivate is up to you. However, nobody, nobody can force you to cultivate. The venerable Ananda thought that because he was the Buddha's cousin, he didn't need to cultivate. He thought that the Buddha would just give him samadhi, but the Buddha couldn't do that. And so it was not until after the Buddha's nirvana, when Ananda was about to edit the the sutras, that he finally certified to the fourth stage of ahatship and realized that he could not neglect cultivation. Be mindful that the body is impure. Don't be so fond of it, and don't take it as a treasure. You say, "I can't stand criticism. I can't stand it." Who are you? If they hit me, I can't bear it. It hurts. Really? If you put your attachments down and see through them, there is neither pain nor not pain. Who is in pain? What exactly hurts? If someone hits you, pretend that you bumped into the world. If someone scolds you, pretend that they are singing a song or speaking Japanese. How can you? How can they scold you if you don't understand them? Are they speaking Spanish or Portuguese, French, German? I've never studied languages, so I don't understand. They can scold you, but it's nothing. In general, once you see through, break, and put down the attachment to your body, you win your independence. Contemplate your body as impure. Don't regard it with so much importance. It's not important. Contemplate feelings, thoughts, and dramas as impure also. Contemplate feelings as suffering. Feelings may be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. From the point of view of the three sufferings, unpleasant feelings are the suffering within suffering. Pleasant feelings are caught up with in the suffering of decay, and neutral feelings are the suffering of process. Wake up! Everything you enjoy is a form of suffering. If you know that pleasure is suffering, you will not be attached to it. I often say, enduring suffering puts an end to suffering. Enjoying blessings destroys blessings. If you endure your suffering, it will pass. If you enjoy your blessings, they too will pass. Contemplating feelings as suffering, the body, thought, and dramas are also suffering. Although there are four applications of mindfulness, you can divide them up. Each of the four characteristic qualities: impurity, suffering, impermanence, and the absence of self can be applied to the body, to feelings, to thoughts. And to dramas, making sixteen applications in all. Contemplate thoughts as impermanent. The Vedas Sutra says, past thought cannot be obtained, present thought cannot be obtained, and future thought cannot be obtained. All your thoughts are unobtainable; they flow without stopping, and so they are impermanent. The body, feelings, and dramas are also impermanent. Contemplate dramas as without self. Basically, since there are no dramas from when come the self, from where come the self? The self is a combination of four elements and the five skandhas, the creation of form dramas. Outside of the four elements and the five skandhas, there is no self. So contemplate dharmas as being without a self. The four applications of mindfulness are very wonderful. If you investigate them thoroughly, 
understand and dwell on them. You will be unattested and will attain true freedom. If you are attested, you can't be free. Why? Because you are attached. So dwell in the four applications of mindfulness. Dwell and yet do not dwell. The six requirements. Ananda's fourth question concerned evil nature pictures. The Buddha said, be silent and they will leave, even while the Buddha was in the world. There were evil natured pictures like men and ordinary people. If you ignore them, the Buddha said, they will get bored and leave. Thus I have heard, thus feels the, the requirement of faith. The drama which is thirst can be believed. Drama which is not thirst cannot be believed. I have heard feels the requirements on, of hearing, since the ears do not hear. Now, do, do the, the hearing, you may ask. Why does it say I have heard? This is because whereas the ears are just a small part of the body, I refers to the whole person at one time feels the requirements of time. Why? You may ask, doesn't the sutra give a month, day, and year? Calendars differ from nation to nation. Some countries begin the year in the first month, some in the second or third month or of another country's calendar. There is no one way to indicate the date. And what is more, if the date were given, people would start doing research to determine if it was correct. Because the sutra only stays at one time, there is no demand for historical verification. In order to speak the drama, there must be an audience. In this case, it was the gathering of great bishops. The audience must also have the time to come and listen, for if they don't stay, of what use is their faith? They must have the time to listen, they must want to hear the drama, and they must believe in it. Then there must also be a drama speaking host. In this case, the Buddha is the host and the place is Travasti in the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary. Therefore, in the opening sentences of the Sutra, all these requirements are fulfilled. Sravasti is the name of a city in India. Translated, it means abundance and virtue, because the seven jewels, gold, silver, papis lazuli, crystal, mother of pearl, red pearls, and carnelian, and the objects of the five desires, beauty, wealth, fame, food, and sleep, were in abundance there. The people of Sravasti were very intelligent and had the virtue of great learning and liberation. You could also say that the objects of the five desires are forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tangibles. The states connected with the objects of the five desires turn people's wisdom upside down. The eyes run off after forms, the ears after sounds, the nose after smell, the tongue after taste the body after tangibles. Deluded people spin around and around in pursuit of the objects of the five desires. The people of Sravasti had great learning and refinement. They were also liberated, free and unfettered, and were only slightly attached. The benefactor's garden. In the Jetta grove, in the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary, Anna Sapindada, whose name means benefactor of orphans and the solitary, was a wealthy elder who lived in the city of Sravasti. He was also known as Sudatta, which means joyous giving. He was a rich man, but he didn't understand the Buddha drama. In fact, he had never even heard the Buddha's name. One day, while arranging for his son's marriage, he visited a friend, the wealthy elder Shantano. That night, Shantano rose and began to decorate his house. 
Sudatta asked, "Are you adorning the house so beautifully? Is there to be a celebration? Is your son going to be married?" "No," said Shantan. "No, I have invited the Buddha to receive offerings." When Sudatta heard the word Buddha, every hair on his body stood straight up on end. Who is the Buddha? He gasped. The Buddha is the crowned prince, son of King Sudodana. He would have been the king, but he left home to cultivate the way and became a Buddha instead. I have invited him here to receive offerings. Having heard the word Buddha, Sudatta couldn't get back to sleep. Shakyamuni Buddha knew that Sudatta's heart was sincere, and he emitted a light which shone so brightly that Sudatta thought it was dawn. Got out of bed and went out of the city. The city gate was locked, but the Buddha opened it with his spiritual powers, and Sudatta proceeded to the Buddha's dwelling in the bamboo grove. Just as Sudatta arrived, four gods descended, circumambulated the Buddha three times, and then bowed in order to show Sudatta the proper gestures of respect. Because Sudatta had never seen the Buddha or heard the Dharma, he followed the gods' example, and the Buddha explained the Dharma to him. Sudatta was delighted and said. Buddha, you have so many followers. You really need a big place to live. I shall prepare one and invite you to live there. Fine," said the Buddha. Sudatta looked, but he couldn't find the right land. Finally, he saw Prince Jetta's garden. It was big enough, but Prince Jetta refused to sell. If you want to buy my garden, he laughed. First, cover it with gold coins. That's my price. So that I didn't stay. So bargain with him. He just said okay and moved his treasury piece by piece to the garden and covered the entire grove. Now your garden belongs to me, he said to Prince Jetta. I was only joking, said the prince, annoyed. I'm keeping it for myself. How could I sell it to you? You told me that you would sell it. I covered it with gold. I took your you at your word. So that I said, if you plan to be the king, you really shouldn't joke with people. A king's word must stand. Very well said the prince. You covered the ground with gold, so the park is yours. But you didn't cover the trees. The trees are mine, but I gave them as a donation. Because the trees belonged to the prince Jetta, it is called the Jetta Grove, and because the garden was Sudatta's, it is called the Garden of the Benefactor of Orphans and the Solitary. In China, when King Wen established the nation, he assisted for kinds of poor people, widows, widowers. Orphans and the childless are solitary. Sudatta also gave aid to these four kinds of people, and so he is known as the benefactor of orphans and the solitary. That is, Anna Tapindada, together with a gathering of great bishops, twelve hundred and fifty in all. This phrase fulfills the audience requirement. Together means that they studied under the same teacher, lived in the same place, and investigated the Buddha Dharma together. They all had the same body mind and had opened the same wisdom, attained the same result, and would together realize Buddhahood. Because they had so much in common, the text reads together. The Sutra text first lists the assembly of Sadhiras because they are sages who have transcended the world. The Bodhisattvas are listed next because they are sometimes bishops and sometimes laymen. They cultivate the middle way, and so they are listed in the middle. The gods and dragons of the eightfold division are listed 
last because they are in the world and represent the common people. Sometimes the Bodhisattvas are present in the Dharma assembly, and sometimes they travel to other worlds. The bishops, on the other hand, were the Buddha's constant followers. They always listened to the sutras and the Dharma, and so they are listed first. Great has three meanings: great, many, and victorious. Bishops are respected by kings and great men, and so they are great. They have cut off afflictions and destroyed the many evils. They are different from and victorious over all external religions. Bishop also has three meanings: seeker of all food, one who frightens Mara, and destroyer of evil. When one ascends the precept platform to be ordained, one's request for ordination may be granted after three appeals. An earthbound yaksha ghost informs a space traveling yaksha, who flies up to inform the heavenly demons. The heavenly demons are terrified and tell Mara, the king of the six, desire heaven. The Buddha's retinue. Has increased by one, and ours has decreased by one. At this, Mara's palace quakes. Thus, a bishu is the one who frightens Mara. He also destroys the evils of the eighty-four thousand officials because he has resolved his might on body.